Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to have you here today. So early in the school year, we're getting started with the first of what I hope will be many exciting sessions uh, having to do with East Asia here at the law school and the broader university. Uh, I'm Jacques Delisle. I'm a professor here at the law school. I also direct the university's Center for East Asian Studies. Uh, and I hope you'll show up at our uh, events. You can get on our various mailing lists uh, if you wish, and I hope that you will. Today's talk is uh, co-sponsored by the Law School and by the Center for East Asian Studies and by the Foreign Policy Research Institute, and I think also by the International Relations Program. Uh, in other words, everybody in sight has piled on to have the opportunity to co-sponsor a talk by today's speaker, and I think you will see why uh, once she begins to speak. Uh, so it, it's, it's my pleasure to welcome to Penn Law School today Regina Yip who is one of the most influential and recognized voices on the issue of Hong Kong's democratization, uh, its pace and trajectory of democratic change. Uh, she also is one of Hong Kong's foremost advocates for building a knowledge-based economy. Uh, she also has been an outspoken critic at times of some of the policies uh, of, of the current Hong Kong government in dealing with the economic crisis. Uh, she is both a student and a practitioner of these areas. She is a member of the Legislative Council in Hong Kong, the legislature, the democratically elected legislature, where she represents the Hong Kong Island uh, geographic, one well, the Hong Kong Island geographic constituencies. She also served as the Security Secretary in the Hong Kong SAR government from 1998 to 2003, and before that also served as Director of the Immigration Department in Hong Kong from 96 to 98. And for those of you who follow Hong Kong, uh, you will know that those are very exciting and challenging times to have held those two positions, uh, given the Article 23 controversy during her tenure as uh, Security Secretary and given the immigration issues, the right of a vote issues that came up around the time of reversion. So she has dealt with some truly uh, tough assignments within the government. Uh, she also is the founder of the Cervantes Policy Institute, which seeks to address both Hong Kong's constitutional questions and its economic challenges. Uh, from 1975 to 2003, she held a number of posts in the Hong Kong government, including the two prominent ones that I just mentioned. In addition to her career in government, uh, she also has quite an impressive educational background, which includes the study of some of these uh, phenomena on which she will speak. She has a master's in East Asian studies from Stanford University, where she wrote her thesis on Hong Kong uh, as a case in democratic development in a transitional society. She also holds a master's degree in business from Stanford, a BA with first class honors from the University of Hong Kong, Hong Kong's uh, leading institution of higher learning, and I believe also a master of letters from Glasgow. Uh, so she has really quite the, uh, the collection of, of impressive uh, degrees. And last but far from least, uh, she is the parent of a Penn undergraduate, uh, Cynthia Ip and the Benjamin Franklin Scholars uh, Program, which is probably how we managed to snag her uh, to come here today. And so we're grateful for that chance. And without taking up any more of your time, I will turn the podium over to Regina. Welcome and thank you. Thank you very much, Professor De Lau, for your very kind and generous uh, introduction. Um, I really feel greatly honored and privileged to have a chance to speak at the UPenn Law School in this uh, historic his uh, university, uh, which has played such an important part in the democratic development of your country. Uh, it's timely to talk about Hong Kong's um, democratic development because um, I hope I'll be able to show uh, in my presentation that we truly are reaching a critical juncture. Um, Hong Kong's democratic development has a short history. It only started, let me, do I have to point in that direction for the forward button? Yes, yeah, to work, yeah. Um, we really have had a short history of democratic development because um, from the time Hong Kong was ceded to the British in 1842 to um, our handover, we were governed in the classical colonial framework where we had decisions made by governor in council and um, supported by two of his most senior secretaries, the chief secretary, the number two second in command overseeing a raft of uh, quasi ministries and, and also the financial secretary overseeing the financial um, economic side of the house. You know, it's pretty simple. We were ruled like that for um, more than 150 years. 
sorry. Until October 1992, when uh, Governor Chris Patton came along, and he was the first politician we had as governor. Before that, the post of governor were, was filled by either um, members of the Her Majesty's Colonial and Colonial Service or Foreign Service. Um, and we had a only real life politician. We didn't have one until the arrival of uh, Governor Patton. And then, um, and then as a parliamentarian, he found it most bizarre that number one, how could a appointed governor be the head of the legislature? And how could career civil servants be hold offices normally held by elected uh, officials as in England? You know, the, all our ministers equivalent posts were held by career civil servants, people like me before I left government. You know. So when, uh, after, shortly after he came in 1992, he decided to remove himself from LegCo as president. And then um, he withdrew all the official members, the last batch of 10 of them, in 1995. Mm. And at the time of our handover, uh, we had two groups of elected members one directly elected from geographical constituencies, people like me, and those elected from what we call functional constituencies, meaning uh, lawyers, accountants, chambers of commerce, or electing their own representatives to, uh, to the legislative council. And then in doing our colonial history, Britain cl came close to granting Hong Kong democracy on two occasions. The first time after World War I, actually uh, a Hong Kong team was already set up in the Foreign Commonwealth Office when the Pacific War was uh, winding to a close. They were preparing to hand Hong Kong over to the Nationalist Party. Uh, and there was a team working on democratization. But then uh, after the Pacific War, after the end of the Japanese occupation, they found that the, and after the communists take over, they, to their surprise, they found that the communists were not keen uh, to take Hong Kong back because they really ne needed Hong Kong as a window on the world. You know? And then why bother to democratize when there, there was no pressure to do so? And they were also exercised by two, I think, valid representational issues. Because in Hong Kong, uh, we had two strange problems. We have a highly skewed taxation system. Uh, among our workforce of 3.5 million people, even now as at the moment, only one point, about 1.1 million are taxpayers. You know, only 1.1 million of our workers are caught by the tax net. And only about 11,000 pay the maximum standard rate of 15%, you know, really. Um, when I attended OECD meetings, you know, they, they could hardly believe we could build our city with such a narrow uh, tax base, but that's how we've done it for many years. So if you enfranchise everybody, you find the taxpayers uh, greatly outnumbered by the non-taxpaying non uh, people, you know, a reverse of what you had when you started your revolution. You know, I, th I believe you started your revolution. One of the reasons was, uh, taxation without representation, but we could end up with having representation without taxation. You know, voters who are not fiscally responsible, just asking for free uh, universal retirement benefits, free universal medical benefits, without having to figure out how to pay for all that. And secondly, our British masters were of course also concerned by the fact that they will be outnumbered by the Chinese community, you know. They won't, they won't be certain uh, of um, that British mercantile interests would be protected in the legislature. So they desisted from uh, giving us the democracy on two occasions immediately after World War II and after the late 1960s Cultural Revolution inspired riots in Hong Kong. After those riots were subsided, um, the British decided to uh, introduce what they call a city district officer system, uh, putting administrative officers in charge of districts 
In other words, bringing officials closer to the people, acting as a bridge between the people and government. And there they stopped. And then, of course, the British had to revive the issue of uh, democracy. In 1979, when uh, one of the, the governors, one of our last governors, later, who, who later became Lord Maclehose, he was quite famous for the role he played in offering ref refuge to quarter million Vietnamese uh, refugees after the fall of Saigon. You know. Lord Maclehose made a courtesy call, courtesy visit to Beijing. This exploring the possibility of extending the lease uh, for the new territories and was told in quite uncertain terms that there will be no question of extending the lease you know, uh, beyond 1997. And so after the return of Lord Maclehose to Hong Kong, he started instructing his ministers to pave the way for returning power to the people. You know. But China, you know, um, was talked into granting Hong Kong democracy in the course of the Sino-British uh, negotiations on the future of Hong Kong. They thought, and still say publicly, uh, that it's consistent with their policy of um, allowing Hong Kong people to administer Hong Kong. But naturally, without any tradition or experience of democracy, they did not know, you know the inherent turbulence, you know, of democratic movements. You know. And China had two major concerns. This is the first bullet was lifted from a official publication, a guide to the basic law, which is our mini constitution, which states very clearly, you know, that this is the PRC constitution as amended in 1982. That's the whole thrust of the uh, national priority was to rebuild China as a socialist country with Chinese characteristics and really with a strong focus of economic development. So they needed Hong Kong to remain thriving as an economic city. And they wanted to ensure that Hong Kong has the political structures apart from keeping its existing capitalist financial economic systems that will ensure our capitalist economy would continue to thrive. You know. In other words, they too were worried about um, the legislature being dominated by non-taxpaying um, populists, rebel rousers, uh, who might threaten the well-being of the capitalist economy. So in the course of negotiating the Sino-British Joint Declaration and drafting the basic law, um, the key principles for Hong Kong's democratic development were broad and balanced representation, meaning you can have the grassroots, you, know, you can have the basic strata, but you all, we also want your captains of industry and, and commerce, or your professionals, or the people, the business elites who help to build Hong Kong, the successful and wealthy city that it is today. You know, we want them in LegCo. You know. And um, so these are, these were, these are really China's uh, guiding principles. And of course, another guiding principle is you cannot have popular sovereignty uh, to the extent of cutting out the sovereign power. You, know. you have to devise a system which ensures that the sovereign power is not threatened or stand in any risk of being subverted in any way. The key provisions in the basic law are Articles 45 and 68. Article 45 providing for the election of the chief executive and Article 68 providing for uh, the uh, election of our legislature eventually by universal suffrage. Um, in the basic law, Annexes 1 and 2 deal with the two methods of election for the chief executive and the legislature. And what it has done is to set in stone, cast in stone in Annex 1 and 2, the methods of election for the first 10 years. So you cannot depart from the um, proportions, the political structure laid down in the first 10 years, for the first 10 years laid down in the Annex 1 and Annex 2 of the basic law. But beyond the first 10 years, 
is for Hong Kong people to discuss, uh, to propose to the central authorities, and to enact into local legislation. That's why we are now in a critical juncture, because it's now 2009. Strictly speaking, we are a bit behind schedule in formulating our proposals. And our administration is being criticized for giving away too little, uh, getting started too late on the blueprint for democratic development for the remaining, uh, for the next 40, uh, 30 odd years of our, um, of Hong Kong as a special administrative region. And the operative provisions are, you know, the, the method for forming the legislative council shall be specified in the light of actual situation and the principle of gradual and orderly progress. Mm -hmm. And as in regard to the selection of the chief executive, I've been reminded by mainland officials that the wording is, it, the chief, your chief could be selected by election or local consultation. You know, it could be either or. But naturally, they recognize in this day and age, with Hong Kong's being increasingly democratized, the chief executive will have no credibility unless he is uh, elected by a widening franchise. So this is our current uh, governance structure. You know, the governor pattern managed to separate the executive branch from the legislative branch and in his five years in office, he did succeed in grooming a highly robust and independent uh, legislature grounded in the people, grounded in the will of the people. And then you have the executive branch still operating, continuing to operate in the old colonial mo model. Uh, the chief executive uh, elected by a very small franchise, as I will show later on, underpinned by ministers and then mostly civil servants. You know. And then something is missing, something is uh, terribly amiss in this model. You know. As some of you may, may have noticed, you know, given your country's uh, democratic tradition. Number one, there is no natural rapport between the executive and the legislative branches. There's no linkage between them. And we have a big piece of jigsaw puzzle missing and that is, we don't have a ruling party. In the parliamentary system, you know, my, my uh, thesis advisor, Larry Diamond, I mean, used to tell me, I mean, he is of the view that uh, you get a much stronger executive-led government when you actually have a parliamentary model, when all your, your, all your ministers are MPs, and if you are able to control parliament with your majority, and with the electoral districts uh, appropriately gerrymandered to ensure uh, the re-election of the incumbents, normally the case, and elected, you know, the prime minister in the parliamentary system can actually stay in office for a long, long time. There are no term limits, you know. You actually get a stronger executive-led government that way. But in our case, we enter the democratic era really, frankly speaking, quite inadequately prepared with very late development of political party. And the um, chief executive, unlike your president, who is supported by, hopefully, a majority of his own party members in Congress, our chief executive is not supported by any political party. And in fact, under our domestic legislation, the election of chief executive ordinance he is not supposed to have political affiliation. The ordinance actually says so. The chief executive should not be politically affiliated, which is really very awkward, but can be easily circumscribed by simply resigning from your party before you stand for election. And then you, and you still remain a de facto political figure. You know? So with this sort of governance structure, you can imagine what sort of trouble the SAR government has run into um, since the, the handover, you know. Um, I mean, the, our administration, our governance in the past 12 years has been mong, uh, marked by declining credibility and approval ratings. 
we've had two chief executives. The first one, a shipping tycoon. He didn't manage to finish his term. The second one, a seasoned civil servant, uh, is not proving to be um, uh, doing any better. And of course, as uh, Professor Dalau mentioned, you know, some of the most controversial, sensitive legislation handled in the past uh, decade, the national security legislation that I personally was responsible for, uh, triggered mass demonstrations of uh, commonly estimated to be half a million people, you know, um, uh, relative to our population of seven million, which is really a very large number, demonstrations of epic proportion. Although mass demonstrations have subsided since, the government's policies, the government has been suffering policy formulation setback regularly. You know. For example, in the past legislative session, 08 to 09, our government has only been able to table 25 bills, whereas in the colonial era, the average would be 40 to 60. And the sort of things that our government has been able to get past by LegCo would be things like emergency financial rescue package for our small and medium enterprises in the, in the wake of the financial crisis, relief for China's Sichuan earthquake victims, um, provision for buying water from Guangdong province, that sort of things, policy issues ranging from tree protection to drug testing in schools, campuses, everything has been queried you know, reopen, queried, and um, thrown back, tossed back to the executive branch. So what has happened is we are really suffering a tremendous par paralysis of public policy making because of this very bizarre structure. And part of the problem is, of course, the highly imbalanced franchise. The chief executive is elected by an 800 strong election committee. Um, his voter base is about 200,000. The Legislative Council has two parts. The directly elected part, including people like me, has a voter base of 3.3 million. My constituency, Hong Kong Island, has a voter base of um, more than 600,000. Know? I was elected by a little less than one-tenth of my voters, 60. 66, 7,000, 66, 000, something like that. You know. Whereas the, the other part of LegCo, the functional constituencies, the voter base is only about 230,000. And you could actually have some functional constituencies comprising chambers of commer commerce with no more than 140 voters. And some functional constituencies, which are actually quite outdated, like textiles and clothing, considering that our textiles and manufacturing have all migrated to the Pearl River Delta. And we have um, very small, if any, uh, workers in the textiles uh, sector. That constituency is actually defunct. And agriculture and uh, fisheries, which constitute no more than one, one or two percent of our economy. You know? So it has, uh, the functional part has many unsatisfactory features. And then against this background, there have been many problems with our uh, semi-democracy. You know, there's a, as I mentioned earlier, a tremendous legitimacy deficit arising from the lack of a connection between a vote, the, the leader, you know, the highest leader, and policy formulation. You know. And uh, I've discussed our problems, our governance problems at nauseum with uh, people from different jurisdictions. And I do agree with some of my former British colleagues you know, that if you had an elected chief you know, and ministers uh, uh, appointed by an elected chief with a strong mandate and a legislature elected by the people and the government indirectly elected by the people through the chief, there will be a greater sense of the people feeling this is my government. I elected it, so I have to put up with it, and notwithstanding all the ups and downs in the five-year tenure. We don't have that. 
policy formulation continues to be done by career uh, civil servants who prefer to work in their air-conditioned offices, who shuns uh, media interviews, you know, who cannot do unscripted uh, media responses, uh, who simply, they are very shy, they continue to be very shy about connecting with the people because this is not what they bargained for. You know, they joined the civil service to have a stable career and basically a relatively quiet life, you know. So we have this problem of legitimacy deficits. And we, are, we don't have a ruling party, you know, the government is not supported by its own ruling party. And we have a hybrid system. We are neither fully parliamentary or presidential. Chris Patton would like to turn us into a parliamentary system uh, in the image of his, uh, his home system, but time ran out for him to do that. You know. And our ministers and civil servants, they are under-trained in uh, politics. They lack the experience. Our chief executive, um, both of them, they don't have the real-life experience of an elected politician. Moreover, our sovereign country, look at our sovereign country. China has quite a notion of democracy as conceived in the West. You know, if you look at China's uh, constitution, uh, she calls herself a democratic country, democratic centralism. You know, in Chinese, um, the Chinese readers among you, in the, in the sense of power, in meaning that power is concentrated in the hands of the ruling party, the CCP, which represents the people. Um, and the China's uh, traditional ethos, political philosophy, is very different from the West. You know, we, our traditional rulers, believe in uh, moral un unanimity, oneness of purpose, the whole nation working hard to rebuild our economy and our society, a return to the greatness of our imperial eras, you know. And Chinese leaders and officials, they're uncomfortable with the sort of individualism and pluralism, which are hallmarks of Western liberal democracies. So they have a, le a lot to put up with through Hong Kong and to learn through us. You know. and, um, and I think what they are, um, and they are also learning from Taiwan as well, the rotation of, uh, of uh, ruling parties and the inherent instability and unpredictability of uh, elections. You, know. you never know which way elections will go. You know. And, um, you know, that's why in Hong Kong's uh, elections, for the election of the directly elected legislative members, where mass election goes in Hong Kong, um, the proportion of votes continue to be like this. The so-called pro-China candidates net about 40% of the votes, and the so-called pro-Democrats net 60% of the votes. You know? which is something that um, gives China reasons to pause before they, give, they are willing to give Hong Kong people more power. You know? And why do people vote that way? Because they don't want the entire, all three branches of government to be pro-China and all pro-establishment. They want checks and balances. You know? So people who manage to get a uh, high proportion of votes like me I got the fourth highest um, number of votes territory-wide uh, in Hong Kong last year, uh, notwithstanding my notoriety arising from Article 23. Um, because I was an independent candidate, I positioned myself as an independent, independent candidate. And that was not just a matter of political positioning, also a matter of my own beliefs and ideology. See, you know, this is what they are saying in the official um, guidance on the basic law. We are reminded time and again, you know, you have no inherent powers. You have no reserve powers. All your powers stem from the central authorities. Even your, your executive, your legislature, you know, they're saying in the official publication, your legislature has been authorized by the national legislature. 
National People's Congress, which is the highest organ of power, through the basic law. You know. And look at our chief executive. This is China's interpretation. You know. the, the wording in our basic law, the chief executive shall be selected by election or through consultations. You know. in, the, in the view of the central authorities, this is no more than a nomination process. You know. Selected by Hong Kong people by election or local consultation. Naturally, local consultation has fallen away. It's simply a non-starter these days, you know, to have a chief executive elected by a small circle. You know. But still, it remains in the eyes of Beijing a nomination process. Mm. The, the see, elected chief still has to be endorsed by the central authorities. So, which means we have to devise a system. Or, or rather, the central authorities have to make sure that we devise a system which does not return a candidate not acceptable to the central authorities in Beijing. It goes the same principle goes for the legislature. Uh, a system has to be devised that strikes a balance between local power and central authority, that we don't return all 60 or in future 80 members uh, who are not only populist rebel rousers, you know, uh, reckless uh, spenders, you know, um, and people minded to subvert the stability of China. But they also accept our legislature has a role in supervising the executive authorities and providing checks and balance. But because of our age-old tradition, uh, age-old tradition of emphasis on harmony and unity. Chai Beijing would really like to see the two branches of government supporting each other. So they talk about mutual coordination in support of Hong Kong's social stability and capital economics prosperity. And then we have other problems in the form of um, retardation of political development we have, our political parties are highly underdeveloped. Our largest party, the pro-China DAB, Democratic Allowance for uh, Patriotic, Democratic DAB, Democratic Allow Allowance for Building of Hong Kong, something like that, a patriotic group. The membership is no more than maybe 12,000 against a population of 7 million, you know. The Democrat Party, which used to be headed by Mr. Martin Lee, a famous human rights uh, advocate and lawyer, his party is no more than six or seven hundred people. As the Civic Party, you know, headed by barristers, British trained barristers, no more than 300, you know. You know. And then uh, the, I, from my own experience, I actually found the voting public suspicious, skeptical political parties maybe because of China's own uh, political tradition. You know, in the imperial era, if you, the parties, they are not mass-based modern parties. They're really cliques of officials in the emperor's court. So to be partisan to any clique is not a hallmark of honor in the old days of government by emperor uh, supported by his mandarins, you know. And then uh, in the legislature itself, under representation of the middle class, you know, of a, of a very important cornerstone of uh, deliberative democracy, uh, women underrepresented, uh, professionals, people who understand the economy, finance, or under uh, underrepresented, and low ratings. Um, I think the underrepresentation of the middle class and the business professionals in our legislature, I blame that partly, partly on our government for um, continuing a skewed system where the uh, elected officials are paid a pittance compared to the appointed ministers and senior civil servants. My own honorarium as a legislator is lower than that of a senior administrative officer you know, which is fairly low in the government hierarchy. And we get much less in terms of resource support 
funding for hiring of legislative assistants and setting up of offices relative to other parliamentarians, you know. And this has naturally retarded, you know, the um, pooling of business talents, you know, well-educated people to the legislature. But there are other troubling features. You know, of course, extension of franchise is very important. I totally subscribe to that. In any democracy, you have to be, give the people the vote so that they could express the view from time to time. You know, whether voting for your highest leader, your legislators, or as they do in California, voting on various propositions from time to time. You know, you have to give the people a vote, you know, and to give people equal political opportunity so that they can take ownership of their government and their public policy formulation. But other than franchise, there are other important features, other important pieces of a, the, that make up a, a functional infrastructure, that make up the infrastructure of a functional modern democracy, like party development, promoting greater trust, mutual respect between the legislative and executive branches, reintegrating the legislative and executive branches, building greater trust between the central authorities and Hong Kong. You know. And because of all the distrust and controversies over our constitutional development in the past 12 years, you know, our government has really not been able to come to grips with uh, some of the most important issues affecting our long-term development. And then because we have a very um, robust, although small in numbers, uh, faction clamoring for a great faster pace of um, democratic development, the National People's Congress Standing Committee put its foot down in um, December of 2007, you know, um, put its cards on the table, in a way also as a concession to Hong Kong people, you know, that you cannot have direct elections in 2012, in effect saying, you, 2012 is too soon for you. But as, as from 2012, the soonest you could have, 2017, that's the earliest you can have election of your chief by universal suffrage. And by 2020, you could have election of your entire legislature by universal suffrage if you could reach a consensus within yourself. So in a way, you could say it's Beijing putting its foot down, and you could also say it's a concession to Hong Kong people giving us a timetable. You, know, you, you people have been clamoring for a timetable. Now you can have it, but you have to work out your own blueprint and your own detailed roadmap and you need to have a consensus within Hong Kong because all this is subject to five procedural requirements. You know. The chief executive needs to formulate his proposals. He needs to consult the people of Hong Kong and then report back to the National People's Congress Standing Committee. Has to be acceptable. And then send back to LegCo for enactment, you know, for discussion, and then enactment of local legislation and the legislation has to be reported back to Beijing to make sure it's consistent with the constitution, the PRC constitution and the basic law as a whole. You know. So you, Hong Kong, you know, in other words, is uh, required to arrive at a consensus within ourselves. And our government is really duty bound to put forward proposals to hammer out a consensus to secure a two thirds majority from our legislature before we could really translate um, the promise of democracy by universal suffrage into reality. At the SAR government, the latest position is, um, the SAR government pledged consultation by Q4 this year at the latest. So time is running out. You know. And secondly, you know, you know, to strengthen the hand against the government, the, the most aggressive um, factions in our in our society, you know, they are drawing their line in the sand, saying that um, these are the, the the groupings I mentioned, 
you know, League of Social Democrats, the LSD group, you know, um, and the Civic Party. There are actually two ends of the democrat democratic spectrum in our political uh, arena. The League of Social Democrats are really quite grassroots. They are really, it's a grassroots group. They have among them, a lot of their followers are those who have been, you know, um, disenfranchised by the uh, Hong Kong's failure to restructure our economy, by the economic development of Hong Kong, you know, people who've lost their jobs, whose income has fallen, you know, uh, who can't get into colleges, you know, the grassroots people, the lower income groups, whereas the Civic Party, about 300 strong, is the more blue-blooded group led by British trained barristers. Now both, you know, are threatening, mass threatening resonations in the five geographical regions in order to force a de facto referendum on democracy. This is their game plan. And if the government would not con uh, bow to their demands, they will threaten, they would uh, stage a mass, destination, mass resonations next ju uh, in July 2011, you know. So really adopting very aggressive tactics. In my view, what we need to do is, you know, the sooner we put an end to the um, um, controversy, decade old or rather quarter of century old controversy over our constitutional development, and the sooner we agree on the rules of the game, you know, draw up the rules so that we can all compete, stand for elections, form our own parties, quasi parties, do membership recruitment according to these rules, the better. You know. And then our political de development should also be more comprehensive, not just focusing on extension of franchise, which is naturally very important, a very important component but also on promoting the development of the full infrastructure, party development, democratic education, promoting a more tolerant and respectful political culture and all that. We really need to, we've been bickering among ourselves for so long that we really, it's really, time is overdue for us to rebuild the trust and mutual respect between our government and the legislative branches, you know. And then um, my own view is we should try our best to uh, hammer out a consensus on electing the CE um, part by, still by an election committee in 2012 and then by universal suffrage in 2017, you know. Electing the CE by universal suffrage would have many advantages of strengthening his mandate improving his connection with the people, and also opening up the field for candidates. I'm sure, I, I do believe we will end up with having stronger and more capable candidates if we open up the field to whoever is eligible under the basic law, rather than a small circle of those friendly with Beijing or the business circles. And on how to deal with functional constituencies without undermining the principle of broad and balanced representation and uh, safeguarding the capitalist economy of Hong Kong, that is retaining the business elites, you know, in LegCo, you know. Um, my own suggestion, uh, which is in the public forum, would be giving every voter two votes, you know, as they have in Japan, Taiwan, New Zealand, Germany, many countries, one vote to vote for a uh, representative in your geographical constituency, and one vote to vote for an at-large constituency comprising the whole of Hong Kong, a list of candidates, people who, who have Hong Kong-wide reputation, you know, who could be the chief executive of our Securities and Futures Commission or Stock Exchange, people with uh, expertise in business, finance, commerce, but no district base, you know, so that we could retain two, two, both sources of talent in our legislature. You know. So in conclusion, you know, it's, it hasn't been easy for Hong Kong to become a modern democratic polity, under the, working under the aegis of two empires, 
first the British Empire and now China, you know, which only ceased to be an empire less than 100 years ago, 1911. We are approaching the centenary of the uh, birth of the Republic, you know. And it is a one-party state. It's not easy, you know. The, the, there is a, such a big gap of understanding about the nature of democracy and the values which inform our, our motherland and the values that inform uh, a liberal Western democracy. But we have always been at the forefront of China's modernization, economic modernization. You know, we have um, our people have invested and introduced a lot of uh, management expertise and cultural change in the, the Pearl River Delta. And Chinese officials, they are learning through us how democracy operates. And they certainly have learned that they cannot publicly back any candidate. If they back any candidate, that would be the kiss of death. You know? And there is no way they can control a democratic election. They are learning through us and Taiwan, the experience of uh, democracy. You know? And we are, we lie at the heart of China's openness and reform, you know, introduced by um, Mr. Deng Xiaoping. Yeah. And I've always been, been telling my friends and uh, former colleagues from the central authorities and provincial authorities, Hong Kong's greatest contribution to the mainland, to the motherland, is to stay open and to help China engage with the rest of the world. That's how we differ from the rest of the, the Pearl River Delta. We don't want to be like Pearl River Delta. We don't want to copycat Shanghai. We just want to be Hong Kong, you know. And by remaining the way we are, that's the best way we could contribute to the welfare and continuous modernization programs of our country. So a lot needs to be done uh, in the coming years, and in fact, when I fly back to Hong Kong in a few days' time, I know I'll be flying back into a mail storm. You know, the the battle lines have been drawn. You know, and then the chief executive. I don't think he can keep the lid off on the political debate very much longer. And I know that I'll be in the thick of the action. And so there, I think I'd like to stop and let you fire questions at me.